Yeah, okay. Cool. Welcome. Happy New Year. 2024, nice and sunny. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's always going to get colder. Um, so thank you for coming. It's the second week of the quarter. We didn't want to have uh, somebody for last week. I was in Alaska skiing <clears throat> silencing. Um, and uh, yeah, so we just started the sequence. I sent the schedule for this quarter. There's three slots that I could be filled. I just email a bunch of you, but if you want to volunteer, please go ahead. We have a few more dates. And uh, today, we're going to start with Dr. Kofu Feng. Who's been with us for about nine months? Less six Less, months. It's yeah. incredible how much she's done. So I actually would assume it would be two years, given the body of work you've done already. Um, so Quan Fu did her PhD in Taiwan and looked a lot at ambient field seismology, monitoring for volcanoes and groundwater, and how that hides the earthquake signals that many of us care about. Quan uh, Fu started on a postdoctoral fellowship from Taiwan, did a one year in Utah, and started looking at. Uh, groundwater monitoring with seismology uh, from the Utah Seismic Network, and she looked at a lot of long-term uh, data in Utah. So we have the same um, delicate uh, discussion about data handling for long-term uh, sensors and things like that. Anyway, so Quen Fu has done a lot of that. Quen Fu is also a postdoc that does a lot of cloud computing, big step cross correlation uh, that will enable science, and that's part of Quen uh, Fu's uh, stay here. And uh, today, Quen Fu is going to talk about what was presented at AGU, um, but you can slow down because yeah. it's not 15 minutes. Yeah. And uh, you'll see basically our first year postdoc work. Yeah, thank you, Marie. And thank you for all your coming to see my presentation. And so today I will show you, I can see either this both sides, so I may need to use my point here. Yeah, cool. So I will show you our progress on this work a decade old survey of uh, near surface seismic velocity response to hydrological variation in Utah. And before that, I would like to like show uh use a bit of time to introduce myself. Marie already introduced a lot. So just show you some slide already. I, I I'm like uh preparing. So I'm from Taiwan and had my yes. I'm louder. Can you speak a little bit louder? Yeah. <laughs> I try my best. So uh, I had my education back in Taiwan and like spent year with uh, uh, spent one year at University of Utah, work with Fancy and joined Marine's group that summer, last summer. Yeah. So basically my main interest in is to study the near surface process from seismology. So like volcano uh, activities, pre-eruptive cycles, sorry. Erupt, pre erupted phases and volcanic eruptive cycles, earthquake response, seasonality, and also the like uh, hydraulic response is a, a main topic of this talk today. And I'm also working on like seismic engineering with Marine after joining the group. So hopefully I will get you some like update in the near future. And let's take Let's back to the topic today. So the following content is basically the present presentation in AGU, so it won't be long. And I will try to slow down a bit. <laughs> so here is a satellite image covering the entire Utah. Utah is in a summit arid region with a limited water availability. So water resources management is always an important issue for a state. In a state, there are two major surface water bodies, the Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake. And that has been seen as an indicator of the water resources for a state. And by this animation, we see that the uh, water level of the Great Salt Lake has been decayed for like in the past like 50 years. And we can see by the animation and also this uh, time series. So conventionally, uh, the most popular method of management for water resources is from satellite image, like Grace Data, with a spatial resolution of 300 kilometers and monthly measurement. 
by this insert map, we can see that uh, the pixel covering the Utah is about one to two grid. Another popular model is NASA's surface land model. It is a data product by compiled different resolution of the data. So it has better resolution in time and space. Then what does it look like if we use seismic sensors? There has been a recent interest in seismologic community to leverage uh, seismic properties due to near surface water variations. Repurposing seismic sensors to investigate the hydrology, we use a seismic measurement, so-called seismic velocity change, dv over v, to explore near surface water with a relative fine scale. So what we measuring is that the perturbation in the seismic wave speed and mostly shear waves and it is also sensitive to the pore pressure. So the spatial resolution of this method is depends on the seismic network configuration. It could be meters to kilometers, and the time resolution could be continuous. For example, uh, as this plot, the analysis of this uh, work is continuous over a decade. So the technique we use is called passive seismic interferometry. We are using the signals of natural vibration continuously recorded by the seismic sensors. The waves are traveling everywhere in the field and the noise correction function between two stations enhance the signals travel from one to the other. The noise correction functions beside the direct wave the coda wave also provides useful information. Sorry to keep. Uh, the coda waves also provide useful information uh, to explore the stru structure. And it's owing to the characteristic of multiple scattering properties. So taking this snapshot as a demonstration, like uh, the coda waves is much sensitive to the change in the media. So back to the noise correction functions. In reality, these waveforms are quite stable over time with very tiny perturbations, meaning that the Earth doesn't change that much. So what we are measuring is the time shift due to those tiny perturbations. And so taking this, taking this advantage and accompanied with the temporal analysis, we can analyze the noise correction functions by different calendar time, like showing like this, and to study the temporal variation of the media. Then assuming the change are homogeneously distributed in the media, so we can transfer this time shift to velocity change. The advantage of this method is that we can perform wherever the seismic stations are already there and make continuously measuring these changes. So when the dv over v, dv over v occur, that might indicate the hydrological response, like a variation in the groundwater level or the stress response, maybe the earthquake uh, event. So let's target at hydrological response. So here is an example of the anti-correlation between the seismic dv over v and groundwater levels changes over the decades. Here the dv over v is split it and colored by the uh, by ray curve. And by this part, we see that when groundwater level goes up, Sorry, the dv over v here is split. I already said that. <laughs> so the groundwater level goes up, velocity decrease. When the groundwater level goes down, velocity increase. And we see this pattern every year. And in a changing climate, the long-term decaying of the groundwater level also captured by the dv over v. Many groups finding this uh, anti-correlation between the seismic dv over v 
and the near surface water, like these two examples showing the anti-correlation between the DVO ravine and groundwater level change. There are some also finding the DVO ravine, anti-correlation between DVO ravine and soil moisture, and also the water table by the stream flow data with a continuous measurement. And several studies are trying are using the hydraulical variable to uh, explain the seismic properties. But in this project, we would like to try the opposite way. We would like to predict the hydraulical properties by studying seismic measurement. So let's see what we got in Utah. So leveraging the existing long-term seismic network in Utah, we analyzed 28 seismic stations, data from 2006 to 2022. Here is an uh, example of our result. We see clear seasonality over the 15 years, 15 years, and there is also a long-term trend, sorry, long-term variation also being captured by our measurement. So let's first focus on this long-term variation. Actually, this long-term variation was captured by most of the station within the Great Salt Lake watershed. I plot the time series of these red triangles stations uh, together here. So this long-term variation actually looks very similar to the long-term water level change of the uh, Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake. I just plot them on top of on, on this top panel. So what we do, we, we just simply overlay the flipped water level because they are anti-correlated to each other. So I overlay the flipped water level on top of DV over V measurement to see the co-evolution between the DV over V and the water levels. So the negative correlation coefficient are showing on the map on your left to uh, the DVRV to the Great Salt Lake and DVRV, sorry, co coefficient between the DVRV and Great Salt Lake water level and to the Utah Lake water level. So the circle size here just represent the relative value between stations. So, uh, here the coefficients are overall above 0.6 at most of station uh, in the negative way, of course. And besides this comparison, which is only one measurement to all the station, I mean the lag levels, another available and representable hydrological component is soil moisture, which is at different scale and could be obtained at different stations. So we collect the soil moisture data from NASA surface land model. We collect the uh, value from the close is the grid data point to the stations. So just uh, showing the grid point by the risker. So here, again, show you one example of the time series like the DVO ruby is flipped and marked by the ray curve and the blue is the soil moisture data. So by this time series, we see the anti-correlation between these two and coefficient between the station, uh, coefficient at each station are showing on the map. Again, the circle size just show you the relative value between stations. And the coefficient here are overall between the 0.3 to 0.6. So conventionally, many groups are trying to uh, understand the seismic properties by investigating the combination of hydrological and thermoelastic stress, uh, thermoelastic uh, effect with a quasi-linear problem. But in this project, we shift the scope to predict hydrology from seismology and also consider the effect of the temporal change on soil moisture variation. So this equation is what we are exploring in this project. I'm not going to detail, but just show you the information here. 
we use the MCMC method with a log likelihood function to explore a parameter coefficient in the model space. So here's a prediction result at an example station. The green curve here is uh, soil moisture data and blue curve is uh, uh, our prediction. By this time series, is, we see an overall good fit throughout the time, although the amplitude is not always perfect. So let's see the fitting result across the stations <laughs> by this animation. So this, in this uh, animation, the circles represent the data and square inside represent the prediction. And they are color coded by the same scale. So we can see the direct, uh, we can direct see the difference by the overlay. So by this animation, we see that I would say the performance looks good overall, although the like uh, there are some slight difference in the amplitude. To explore the relationship between the near surface water and the seismic DV over V, there, there's a, a research uh, using two models to consider the different uh different model, like only consider the uh, effect of the groundwater or the contribution of the soil moisture plus groundwater. So here's a layer like a uh, model to fit the DVRV in black. So by this plot, actually in their result, they think that the combination of the two model actually better explain the absurd DV over V. So by this plot, in the gray, in the gray stage, the model A better explain the DV over V. But in the white stage, the model B explain the DV better than the model A. So it might suggest that the uh, uh, complexity of the water dynamics in the near surface water. And it also be sensed by the seismic velocity change. But unfortunately in our study area, the comparable groundwater level data is limited by location and time. So we, we couldn't do like considering the soil moisture and the groundwater at the same time at, at, at the same station. We will figure out to maybe keep this concept to apply it to other study area. So all right, let me summarize this work. Through analysis of decades of continuous seismic recordings across Utah, we find the long-term variation fits well with the long-term change of the water level of the Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake. The seismic DVOV measurement provide an overall good fit or good correlation to the near surface water. And we propose a proxy to uh, using seismic data to predict uh, soil moisture. And it turns out that this proxy can provide useful information in exploring soil moisture. But there are some further study or further investigations still needed. Although the performance of our proxy looks good, the in situ calibration between the DV over V and soil moisture are still needed. The other thing is that our model may be too simple because we still see some minor signal pattern in the residual, I mean, those mismatch amplitude between the data and prediction. So the last point is that the water dynamics between the soil moisture and groundwater level are complex. It would also be sensed by the seismic measurement. So it will become a hard question to answer. However, in our study area, we we don't have like comparable groundwater data can be used in our study area. So maybe we just keep this concept or use this proxy into our study area, which have the like com more complex hydrological data to study the by using the uh, same concept and proof our proxy. All right, so that's what I have today. Thank you for your time.
In one of your uh, very early slides, it looks like in the first part of this, it was like a black and yellow time series. There was a very high correlation between DV over V and groundwater. And then there was not, then there was a period of time that had not much correlation. Okay. What are your very early slides? Maybe early, California. Early California. But, but just in general, uh, uh, what does it mean when there are, what happens, happen, what's going on when there's not a good flow? At the times when there's not a good flow? How do you explain that? Like, why do you have good correlation sometimes, but other times you don't? I would say the seismic velocity change are sensitive to, like, um, like it is integral, sense integral to the depth. So, but the ground level might be inside. And sometimes when it goes down, the ground goes up, you will not, I mean, the DVRE measurement are kind of measuring all the stuff within this range. And so sometimes the groundwater level change is the most uh, influence or the most uh, contribution on during that period. But sometimes the other effect uh, contribute to more to like, sometimes groundwater level is um, uh main influence factor. But sometimes the other thing we don't know, maybe over uh, become the main factor to affect the DB. That's my opinion. So, so you, you see a strong, very strong correlation over like many months. Uh, do you still see this at much shorter time scales, or is the signal noise ratio of the correlation not good enough at that shorter time scale? This was a 90 day average, <clears throat> smooth over 90 days. So and that's about as low as you can go and still get a good correlation? For this study, yes, but other studies of the water table study, the with the data from the Berger Grass paper, the Berger Grass paper was shorter for the conversion. One thing about the model we use is it's uh, the formulation is a linear combination of terms. They're not coupled. So we just decompose of the of the that. The thing is um, we can't expect coupling for instance, the thermal decrease of the TV for the temperature affecting velocity will probably change if it's wet or not. And we don't, we have a stationary constant thermal decrease TV for the And so the simplified models may not capture the thermal, some thermal thermal changes. And that change of density you mentioned is also correct. You know, it's like a, you have a exponential decay of depth, and so it will change that. Thank you. Yes, I have a question about the data, and I, I, and I don't know anything about it, but you said it was a NASA data product. So that suggests that the soil moisture is also remotely sensed, not measured directly. Yes. And there must be some inferences that are being made about whatever the satellite is sensing and direct connection to the soil moisture. Yeah. Does that mean that you have to also be uh, concerned about what are the uh, co-varying pro properties for the data and your DV measurements? Co-varying? No. Um, so for the soil moisture data, yes, we, we we collect from the NASA surface model and it's a combination by uh, different data product. So yes. Uh, let me think of it. So actually, it's not only consider remote sensing, but consider the, like uh, it's a model like um measuring the energy energy budget variation. So to me, I mean, I'm not a soil moisture expert, but my answer understanding is that is uh considering to fit with the all the different company, uh, all the different data and the soil moisture, just the uh, data output or data product by those product. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Model that helped ask, but I know it is a model. It's not actual data. Yes. We're calling it data. 
Um, so the other, so it's model, the data that it is based, the actual like remote sensing data is very coarse resolution and has a lot of studies that compare it to kind of site specific in situ soil moisture data don't actually show a very good correlation. So I wonder if actually comparing to real soil measured soil moisture data could be a better approach, but that's very hard to get. Just like a lot of the soil moisture data sets aren't necessarily available. But I wonder if, if comparing it that way might work. Yes. That's why we were four years. It's a part of we just don't have those yeah. Well, I mean, couldn't just do that. Yeah. But is there any like a few um uh, like soil moisture institute? We have only one experiment. And the EDIA study that you showed. There's so sorry. Okay. There's two this is um spatial resolution by this measurement is about like one kilometer uh set a uh, seven center like with a radius of one kilometer and the depth is around like top 200 meter so yeah it's like integrate and also we compare with the model not a real in situ data so yeah we we did you know yeah thank you um i had the uh, like supplement figure on the left plus is the uh, like the relative uh normalized residual at each station and i'm not preparing the like time series residual but just showing the summarize so kind of yeah. Uh, the east west side diagram and then there's a plane on the left side. Um, maybe that's all irrigation based. Slope based. Yeah, we can check you out. Slope, maybe. From the three. Yeah. So we can check. Snap, just the fundamental depth to water table must be really very from almost at the surface to hundreds of meters deep. So is there a is there a systematic correlation between either the 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 amplitude of the velocity variation or anything else you observe with depth to water table? There's a total depth. Yeah. 
you are able to have the but it's well, it's it use it of all kinds of hydrological products. Yeah, it's good even if you have the dirty well, you yeah. the water table map. Yeah, I guess the water table map. Yeah. We tried geologic survey has people who are very concerned about their water resources, so there might be uh, extra data at the state level. Mm -hmm. Following up on that, that other map you showed, I just noticed that there's some wells plotted next oh. to some of the stations. So, yes. is there a direct comparison between groundwater levels in those wells and the data? Actually, yes. I have some like. So, we have like two wells close to the station. One is this one, HVU, and the other one is DUG. But I say it's close, but it's still like 10 kilometer away to the station. So uh just show you the time series. The red is a uh, DVRV and green is a uh, ground water level uh table, but a little bit in a wells as it is a direct measurement. So kind of like water cycle are very similar, but the long term trend kind of like a little bit different. And also, this one going down, but DV seems like not change a lot. So, yeah. So, I would say maybe 10 kilometers is a bit far to compare or say a story. Yeah. Well, in some of these time series plots, comparing the DV on the DV and the various other units, there it seems to be either a consistent a consistent either lag or advance between the two the velocity changes and the, the water level, whatever color you're measuring. Is that telling you are those lags or advances telling you something useful about the process um, and the variability and so on to correlate with the diffusivity or the fracturing or just something. Is there any, anything that can be gleaned from the consistent time differences? You mean the time difference between the... So, in other words, in, if you look at the bottom one, Yes, it appears that the, the red, I guess it's the DV over V in the day well, Down. always consistently lags the reservoir level. Yes. Is that telling you something about the, the material and the permeability or some physical process? process yeah. Or is that just a process of using? So, and similarly, the green, the top one, the green seems to lag the red consistently. Is that useful information, those lags? Yeah. <laughs> In the model, DV is proportional to uh, uh, four for ratio. Yeah. And so this would have to work to diffusion. When the different locations between the well and the and the site, you know, the station, second station, same for the red. Although the lake it seems the opposite would be opposite. Yeah, but I, I am not a Georgia, but is the lake upstream? Yeah, I don't, but it's, yeah, it does. I was just wondering if there's some added information from yeah. the other lags. Yes. Another interpretation is that since it's a sinusoid, that if you add that add a seasonal thermal elastic signal to a seasonal poor elastic signal, and they're going up the exact same period, then it's going to arbitrate a phase shift and it's inseparable. It's not an ideal interpretation, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a question on that. On Ray? Uh, hi, uh, this is Ray from Washington Geologic Survey. I'm uh, interested in this precipitation relationship and 
Uh, I wonder if there was any, uh, in this observation time, uh, any swarm event related to those changes. Yeah. And that uh, velocity changes and precipitation uh, and maybe groundwater change and then um, any triggered or uh, not triggered, but uh, any relationship with any swarm uh, events happen in this region. I mean, earthquake uh, swarm. So in Utah, the most uh, swarm active region is in like southern, mm -hmm. uh, southern Utah. There is a like geothermal uh, system here. And actually I didn't check with the uh, swarm activity, but in our, like in, in Utah, the, uh, the rainfall is rare. So kind of like I trying to using the NASA's model rather than using the precipitation because the precipitation is really few. Yeah, in Washington, uh, we saw this kind of event uh, related to maybe seasonally repeated swarms in uh, uh, Gold Bar area. And so I wonder if this methodology can fit in that. Um, that kind of environment. I think it was 2014 or earlier. So I have to check. So every uh, August to September season change and then rain starts and somehow triggered back to back that three years almost. That's a good point. We can try. Yeah. It's a gold bar uh, north east of uh, Seattle area on highway two. Highway. Thank you for your yeah. information. You can yep. check. Yeah, I have some observations and I can send you if, if needed. Oh, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I, I'm not very familiar with this method. So I'm gonna ask a stupid question, but no. um, if, Assuming, I'm going to assume that the correlation, the, the Green's function that you correlate is propagating as surface waves mostly. Does that, and since surface waves are sensitive to depth, at, you know, have different sensitivities for different depths, does that hold out the promise that you could actually determine where in the soil column, these uh, uh, variation, velocity variations are being made. So you wouldn't just have a single dV over V, but you, it would be a frequency of the dV over V. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, awesome. it, yeah, that's a very good point. And yes. yeah, and we also try to like using lower frequency band to see the dV over V. But the time series, like, I mean, the seasonality doesn't really like obvious as the higher frequency range. I mean, I try to use like 0.1 hertz to 0.9 hertz and also 0.4 hertz to 1 hertz. But the result is not, I mean, the 0.4 to 1 hertz, the result is kind of not stable. I would say the noise source is kind of like um, not as like strong as the like higher frequency. And so, yeah, so I only show you the like high frequency, like two to four hertz. Is is the frequency that we use? Yeah. So, and it's like sends to top of two hundred meters. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's the shallow. Shallow. The shallowest. But not shallow enough to see very variation. Very, yeah. Understand the response. So if it's Modeled as pore pressure dependent primarily, that's saying it's coming from the saturated zone, the, the ground water below the water table. So, and that makes sense, I guess, because most of the water table is probably much shallower than 200 meters. But yeah, so does the soil moisture and any property of the Beta zone even matter? Or maybe a better question is can you disentangle the effect of the unsaturated zone from the effect of the uh, saturated zone in the velocity response? 
I think that's doable, but yeah, so it will comes to because like very shallow, I mean, unsaturated zone, which means that very shallow part of the like top layer. So we need to use like high frequency, higher frequency range to analyze it. And also we need also need the in situ measurement to a soil or groundwater. So that's doable, but I will say it will be tough in our case. Can you though let um, uh, bad human behavior uh, give you the or 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 um, human diet for that matter give you the the, the the what you need the test you need? So there was a fine story in the New York Times about groundwater withdrawal or, or finding the groundwater mm -hmm. in uh, the, the, the the Snake River plant by um, dairy farmers who have moved to Idaho, and now Idaho is like the third largest producer of cheese in the United States. And they've been they've been just pulling groundwater out there like crazy. And so the they and they have lots and lots of wells with they give them data on both the groundwater but on the water table levels. And and meanwhile it keeps you keep having these seasonal cycles, right? That are gonna wet and dry your yes. Your your soils and give you the the in that unsaturated zone give you the, those those signals. So it seemed like you could you could take a place where people really have been um, uh, pulling on the straws of groundwater and compare compare a signal back. Yeah. The only problem is sharing groundwater well data is impossible in the United States. What do you mean? It's been so hard. They're flooded hundreds of those. Things. Yeah, but there's studies in like California groundwater well with like thousands of points and like no shareable data. Well, that's what you said other times, John. I know. Yeah. Seismologists are uh, uh, accustomed to a luxury of data. Yeah, but this is. I, if you, if you there's know, some data on the screen right there. That how much is the water level at, at over one site. 20 years only changed by less than one meter. Right, but it's only at one site. Yeah, so we want to make it Well, but mm -hmm. we also want to count. And we need a calibration. It's one of the issues, we need a calibration, but um, it's really hard to find regularly sampled groundwater well data. Mm -hmm. And especially with your sample, it's every water district has their own rights. And the US database is, is improving, but they're not sampled at every day. And it's uh, still not the uh, Python script to download, download every last long water level. Yeah. Well, very, I, I think California, there's this law that was just about a decade old now or something about, about monitoring. And, Mm -hmm. and, and and you know trying to conserve groundwater mm -hmm. and there must be state agencies that are that have their eyes on that information and that get published. Yeah. Uh, this is Ray. I think uh, the Department of Ecology has uh, monitoring wells in eastern Washington, I know. Uh, and they are monitoring the groundwater changes. That's in California has been really not open. But it would be great to try that in Washington. I have a sense that it's 2,000 wells that they're actually monitoring. Those are big. Uh huh. Like, the majority of those, at least in California, though, are, are only sampled like once or twice annually. And then in Idaho, like, I would, you know, the study that we've been doing is where are the testing stations? There needs to be some competition, so but um, yeah. well, thank you so much. No question, thank you so much, Quincy. Thank you. Thank you.